Yeah, I mean, look, there's only two things I don't like about this uh, reconciliation bill. One is the massive spending, and the other is how they raise revenue, <laughs> because they're both problematic. And this is one example where we did a lot of work on this, as you know, in the infrastructure package. And over the years, um, Senator Crapo and I have been focused on this IRS issue. How do you modernize the IRS so that, you know, it can be a more effective tax collection agency but respect people's rights? The numbers they're coming up with are totally out of line with what we found in our analysis, but also what uh, Congressional Budget Office is telling them. So it's another example where uh, unless they're doing as the Joint Tax Committee says they are, which is going uh, into people's bank accounts who are relatively lower income um, and, you know, creating incredible intrusion into people's lives, they're, they're not going to raise the revenue that they're claiming that they're raising. So it creates a gap on, on the revenue side. So. There's just so many issues like this with this legislation. Part of it is because you all and we have not had the chance to actually sit down and analyze it because we weren't, haven't been part of the process and because no committee has been part of the process. So it hasn't gone through the Ways and Means Committee. It hasn't gone through the Finance Committee. So it's just it's a, it's a good example. But let me give you a couple others. Senator Hovind was just talking about the impact of the $80,000 cap versus a $10,000 cap. That in, com in combination with the other provisions in this bill means that millionaires, people making over a million dollars a year, are going to get a big tax break here. Over 68 percent, almost 70 percent of millionaires are going to get a significant tax cut under this legislation. Those between $500,000 and a million dollars, 90 percent of them are going to get a significant tax cut under this legislation. However, if you're making 30000 bucks a year, only 30 percent will get a tax cut, and only in the first year. In the second year, it goes to 12 percent, third year to 10 percent, and down into single digits. So think about that discrepancy. The people who are going to benefit from this on the revenue side are the wealthiest Americans, and those who will be hurt are middle-income Americans and lower-income Americans. So whether it's the spending side or the tax side, there's a lot of issues in here as we flesh them out and look at them are very troubling. Let me give you another one that's very concerning to me. There's a 25 percent minimum tax on the domestic side for companies. It's called a book tax. So they're looking at, instead of the way income tax is calculated by the IRS, they're looking at what your book tax is based on your financial statements. Now, sounds innocent enough, right? As we begin to dig into this, we find out that this is going to affect defined contribution and defined benefit pensions, particularly defined benefit pensions. How? Because those pension plans if they have an increase in their assets, currently are not taxed to the company, right? Because it's totally separate. So if you have a company that's, you know, let's say making uh, 100 million bucks a year in profit, and yet has in its pension plan a 1 billion or 200 billion dollar increase in the assets, maybe because interest rates have gone up, maybe because the market went up. Now, for the first time, that company is going to be taxed on those increases in the assets on the pension plan. Remember, 100 million bucks over here, you got a $2 billion uh, increase over here, you apply a 25% tax to that, you're bankrupt. I mean, what are your choices? You either have to go out and borrow the money to pay your taxes, or you have to say, we're, you know, we're going we're gonna to fold this company. Who does that hurt? That hurts the people that are in these defined benefit plans, which, frankly, Democrats in the past have always strongly supported. A lot of them are union plans, as you know. And we're encouraging, you know, some of our friends in the in the union community to take a look at this. This is this is the impact of this so-called minimum tax. Again, it sounds innocent enough, but it really hurts people. Second example might be bonus depreciation. You know, if you're a small business, you've really taken advantage of this, but so have a lot of larger businesses that will be caught up in this book tax. So if you make an investment in expanding your plant or equipment, you can take an immediate write-off. That was in the 2017 bill. It's been very popular. Why? Because it's helped the economy and helped create jobs and economic activity. Under this new tax, this new minimum tax, it takes away that benefit for many companies to be able to get that immediate write-off under the bonus depreciation. I don't think anybody wants to do that. I, I think a lot of these are almost inadvertent. I can't imagine they would want to. But these are some examples, and you dig into this, whether it's the, the IRS uh, provision you mentioned with regard to people's privacy and the burdens on individual taxpayers, or whether it's some of the ways these tax increases are going to hurt businesses and ultimately workers. By the way, the Joint Committee on Taxation and CBO and other analysis has said that when you increase taxes on companies, who takes a hit? Workers do in terms of wages and benefits. Seventy percent 
of the impact of these tax increases will be on workers. So this is the wrong time to do this, for sure. High inflation, uncertain economy, uh, in part due to the COVID challenges we face, and record high debts and deficits. We know that this is stimulative spending on the spending side that will add to inflation. We all said this was going to happen back in March with the $1.9 trillion bill. Unfortunately, we were right. Much more demand going into the economy because you're supplying more of the stimulus capital into the economy, overheating the economy. That's what's caused inflation. On Friday, we'll know the inflation numbers um, from last month. Uh, I'm hoping soon we'll have CBO giving us an analysis of what the actual cost of this plan is because everyone who's looked at it says the same thing, which is, yeah, as Senator Hoven said, you got 10 years of revenue, but you're ending the tax credit after one year, the child tax credit. Is that going to happen? Historically speaking, no. Congress will extend it, and yet it's not paid for in this legislation. This is why the Penn Wharton study says it's more like $4.6 trillion. Others say it's more like $4.7 trillion. Even if it's close to that, that's twice as much as Congress has ever spent on any legislation in its history. Uh, number one would be the $1.9 trillion <laughs> from March earlier this year. So my hope is that people will take a look at this and say, you know, this just does not make sense, particularly at this time. And uh, make the decision to stop the stimulus spending, try to get inflation under control, stop the record debts and deficits, and bring more economic certainty to our country.